Hello, and welcome to the next episode of the Software Carpentry Lecture on Program Design using Invasion Percolation as an example. In this episode, we're supposed to talk about testing, but there's something else that we have to do first. In the previous episode, we found and fixed one bug in our program. But how many others haven't we found? More generally, how do we validate and verify a program like this? Those two terms sound similar, but mean different things. Verification means, is our program free of bugs, i.e., did we build the thing right? Validation means, are we implementing the right model, i.e., did we build the right thing? The second question is one for scientists to answer. So we'll concentrate in this lecture on testing our program. Except, as we said earlier, there's something we have to do first. We are actually going to take a look at how we make our program more testable. Testing anything that involves randomness is difficult. So in order to convince ourselves that our program is working, we need to come up with examples that aren't random. Here's one. This grid has the value 2 everywhere, except in three cells that we have filled with 1s. If our program is working correctly, it should fill exactly those three cells, and nothing else. If it doesn't, it should be pretty easy for us to figure out what's gone wrong. Here's the overall structure of our program as it currently stands. This function, fillgrid, is the one we want to test. So let's reorganize our code to make it easier to create specific grids. Grids are created by the function createRandomGrid, which takes grid size and value range as arguments. Let's split that into two pieces. The first creates an n by n grid containing the value 0. The second overwrites those values with random values in the range 1 to z. We can then call something else in order to fill the grid with non-random values when we're testing. This change is pretty simple and is left as an exercise for the viewer. Here's another part of the old program that we need to change. It takes command line arguments and converts them into integers in order to determine the grid size, the range of random values, and the random number seed. Our new structure is going to use a function called parse arguments to do the same job. We're also going to introduce a new argument in the first position called scenario. This doesn't need to be converted to an integer. It's just a string value specifying what we want to do. If the user gives us the word random, then we will do exactly what we've been doing all along. If the user gives us anything else, for the moment, we will fail. But later on, we'll use scenario to determine which of our test cases we want to run. We're not going to need random numbers when we fill the grid manually for testing. We're also not going to need the value range or the grid size. Let's move argument handling and random number generation seeding into the if branch that handles the random scenario. Once we make this change, we determine the scenario by looking at the first command line argument and then if that value is the word random, we look at the remaining arguments to determine the grid size, the value range, and the random seed. If the first argument isn't the word random, then we fail. And here's a closer look at what's inside that first if case. We parse arguments, seed the random number generator, create a grid, fill it with random values, mark the center cell as filled, fill the rest of the grid, and then print out how many cells were filled. The names of the functions fillgridRandom and fillgrid are very similar. It would be very easy for people to confuse them if the code was being read aloud. Let's rename the first one to initGridRandom. The functions that initialize the grid for specific test cases will then be called initGrid and the name of the test case. And while we're here, let's clean up something that we first pointed out a couple of episodes ago. We are manually filling the center cell and then calling fillgrid to fill the remainder. That means we have to add one to the result returned by fillgrid. Since we do this in all of our scenarios, let's just move that code into fillgrid. So the fillgrid function now marks the center cell and fills until it reaches the boundary and returns the total number of cells filled. This is less of a burden on people using our code because they don't have to remember to mark the center cell themselves or to add one to the results of filled grid. And here's the structure of our revised program. We have the documentation string, which, by the way, we've updated 
to remind people that the first argument is the name of the scenario. Our fail function hasn't changed. We've split grid creation into two functions. Our fill grid function now fills the middle cell and returns the count of all filled cells. And we have a function to parse command line arguments. This argument parsing function is actually specific to the random case. We should probably rename it to make that clear. Now let's step back. We were supposed to be testing our program, but in order to make it more testable, we had to reorganize it first. And the jargon word for this is refactoring. This means changing a program structure without modifying its behavior or functionality in order to improve its quality. Entire books have been written about how to refactor programs systematically. The first and most influential was by Martin Fowler, and it's mostly a catalog of refactoring techniques for object-oriented programs. Another was by Michael Feathers. He describes how to refactor legacy programs, i.e. programs that you've inherited that may be very tangled or poorly documented, or in most cases both, in order to make them easier to test. And the examples in this book are drawn from many different languages. Now that we've done this refactoring, we can start to test our program.